know the name Doug Papa? Yes, I do. God bless Doug Papa, an honest cop. I was elated, of course, but then as he testified, I was, I was somewhat concerned for him because I knew that they were probably going to crucify that man. The top cop who put his badge on the line for justice. One man who confronted truth and consequences. Welcome to Truth and Consequences with Doug Papa, episode 52 for Friday, June 4th, 2021. It is with a heavy heart that I announce that Jesus Carvajal, an innocent man who was wrongly arrested and charged in 2018 by Las Vegas Metro Police, has passed away at the age of 36. According to his brother Pedro, their mother found Jesus deceased in his Las Vegas apartment on Wednesday night at about 6 o'clock p.m. She had gone to Jesus' apartment to conduct a welfare check because the family did not hear from him in a few days. Pedro Carvajal told me that the family is waiting to hear from the Clark County Coroner's Office for the results of the autopsy. Jesus Carvajal's story is a tragic one, a tragedy of justice. I covered the story of Jesus Carvajal for the Baltimore Post Examiner in 2019, and again last year on episode 8 of my podcast. Jesus Carvajal's life was turned upside down because of incompetence and negligence on the part of Las Vegas Metro Police Vice Detectives who investigated the case that led to his arrest. He was totally innocent. Now, here is episode 8. I will have my closing comments at the conclusion. Welcome to episode number 8 of Truth and Consequences with Doug Papa. This is a follow-up to a story I had authored in December of 2019 that was published by the Baltimore Post Examiner. In the early morning hours of August 9, 2018, detectives with the Vice Unit of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, aided by the SWAT team, conducted a search warrant at the Las Vegas residence of Jesus Carvajal, which culminated in the arrest of Mr. Carvajal, who was then charged with impersonating police officer, several counts of sexual assault, and kidnapping. Jesus Carvajal spent almost three weeks in the Clark County Detention Center and another two months on house arrest. The problem was, Jesus Carvajal was an innocent man who was wrongly arrested and jailed for crimes that he did not commit. The charges against Jesus Carvajal were later dismissed. Another man, Tommy Lee Provost, was later charged with the crimes. On Monday, August 10, 2020, Las Vegas attorneys Michael McAvoy Amaya and Timothy Rivero, representing Jesus Carvajal, filed a civil rights violation lawsuit against the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and the Clark County District Attorney's Office in the United States District Court for the District of Nevada. The complaint alleges that vice detectives misrepresented facts in the warrant application for Carver Hall's arrest, failed to disclose material evidence and facts known by the officers to the issuing judge, and concealed exculpatory evidence for months that resulted in Carver Hall's wrongful arrest and confinement in violation of his constitutional rights. The complaint also alleges that the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department has a policy and practice of concealing police misconduct. Please refer to the screenshots in this video for further information. Right now, here is a video clip that was posted on Facebook last month by Jesus Carvajal, followed by my recorded interview with Las Vegas attorneys Michael McAvoy Amaya and Timothy Rivero. My name is Jesus Carvajal. I'm going to try to make this as short as possible because my case is pretty complex. Um, but you go into the Baltimore Post Examiner article made by Doug Papa. Uh, he did a pretty awesome job. There's a lot of detail on what happened to me. And actually there's more stuff that's been uncovered since then. Uh, but on August 9th, 2018, uh, pretty much pulled out of my home by sound grenades and flashbangs in my underwear. A home was ransacked for two hours. Uh, no information was given to me until after the fact when the detective told me that he was charging me with uh, multiple counts of impersonating a police officer, multiple counts of sexual assault, uh, and I believe it was assault with a deadly weapon. A total of like about seven or eight felonies. Uh, I was paraded into CCDC in my underwear, and that's where the humiliation started. Then, uh, the following morning, a few hours from that morning, actually, my face was plastered on national TV. 
and in Mexico uh, calling me a, a rapist, really. Uh, saying that I was a person, a police officer, and sexually assaulting uh, sex workers. My life was completely destroyed. Uh, I lost my job while I was in CCDC. I used to be a dispatcher slash supervisor for a company that works directly under Amazon as a delivery service provider. A lot of the people that I trusted, that I cared for in this town, and even back in my hometown in LA, turned their back on me, including family members. Uh, the humiliation, even to this day, is unbearable. Um, all due to the lies and information being altered and information being hidden because in reality all they had was just the color of my skin I matched the description of a dark skinned Latino mixed with Filipino a dark skinned Latino with, mixed with Hawaiian and a light African American and on the lineup I was the only one that matched the description um, part Afro-Cuban and Mexican for those that don't know Cuba has a lot of uh, influence through Africa due to the slaves uh, trade and everything. Therefore, there's a lot of Cubans that are, have African in them that are a darker shade of uh, brown. And they use that against me in the fact that I own firearms and I train and I used to play professional paintball and, uh, you know, and they just compiled, I don't know how, whoever signed the warrant, they didn't look into all the red flags, but uh, the person was smaller uh, cut. I was I'm taller. I was 290 pounds, which is a big difference. My car didn't match the description. My car wasn't even working at the time. Nothing really tied. I was left behind after I was exonerated. I had to reach out to the media myself to let them know that I was tired of looking at my face and those bad articles. Uh, there's still some bad articles out there that haven't been changed. I lost, like I said, my job. I lost my car. I'm in debt. I lost my home, uh, just me and my dogs now, uh, renting a living room space in a one bedroom apartment uh, where we're getting bit by bugs all the time and a bad neighborhood and no one uh, is fighting for me, you could say. No one wants to fight for me because this town is small and everyone's scared of LVMPD and the DA. Even though there was a lot of negligence, they withheld information, they altered stuff, they lied under oath. Uh, yet, I'm pushing to try to get my record expunged. Uh, I'm glad I helped to push AB 267, which was a bill that I testified for, but it doesn't help me because I wasn't uh, convicted. But it hopefully, I hope no one gets Gus to go through what I go through, but it's going to happen, and I hope this bill helps them. And, uh, yeah, you know, counseling, uh, being on self-quarantine for two years now, you know, I don't go out much. I, I do my regular routines, just work in the store, but I can count with both of my hands and not all my fingers how much times I've actually gone out to try to enjoy myself um, because people have recognized me, you know. Um, but yeah, like I said, going to the Baltimore Post Examiner, look, read that article, and I hope that more people look into people like myself that have survived and what we're going through because people don't understand that it's tough. 11th, 2020. I'm on the phone with, with Las Vegas attorney, Michael McAvoy Amaya. Uh, how you doing, Mike? Uh, also, also, Timothy Rivera. This is and Doug Papa. and who's, who's the other attorney there? Hey, Doug. Tim here. And what's your last name, sir? It's Rivero R E is an echo. V is an Victor. E is an echo. R O. Okay. I have uh, received a copy of the complaint you filed with the U.S. District Court yesterday, reference to Jesus Carvajal's lawsuit. Can you explain briefly to my audience what, what that encompasses? Um, it is a civil rights complaint uh, pursuant to um, 18, uh, 42 U.S.C. 1983, I believe. It is uh, a civil rights action. Um, Jesus is civil rights were violated egregiously by the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and the Clark County District Attorney. Um, they, uh, it is our belief that during um, the investigation of the crime, uh, Jesus was 
uh, ultimately arrested for. Um, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department was um, seeking to um, deflect away from the uh, FBI investigation that was into the uh, department at the time involving vice unit detectives, um, in part having sex with prostitutes um, in the Las Vegas area, and that um, because of the investigation, they were just looking for someone to pin the allegations um, that of numerous prostitutes in the area that they had been sexually assaulted by a person claiming to be a vice officer. And so that resulted in a very hasty and and bad investigation into the matter, and they just uh, decided to cut corners and make misrepresentations to um, the judge that issued the search warrant against him and the judge that uh, ultimately heard um, his bail request and his own recognizance recognizance release request and that resulted in him being not only unlawfully you know arrested you know his property searched and seized and uh and unlawfully uh in prison and his entire life has been turned upside down and because of these you know pretty serious violations of of our client's constitutional rights uh the uh the county and the city of las vegas should should pay Okay. To, uh, to give this man his life back because his entire life has been ruined, and he had nothing, no, no priors, no anything. This is, I mean, Heitz is a good, is a good man. He's a manager at a, you know, at an Amazon um, distributor. He, you know, was a model. You know, was relatively speaking a model citizen, and you know, this just destroyed his entire life. Right. I interviewed Mr. Uh, Carver Hall Jesus last year when I did the story on him. And um, I want to bring something up, too. Former Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Officer Gavin, Gavin Vesp, V-E-S-P, was uh, a licensed private investigator who was hired by Jesus's first attorney. And he <laughs> uncovered much of the stuff that I put in my story about the, the negligence and the misconduct uh, that occurred during the investigation that led to Jesus's arrest and, well, prior to his arrest, the execution of the search warrant on his house. Um, is Mr. Vesp cooperating with you on this or, or not on this part of it? He is not. Um, he has uh, not been willing to speak to anybody about his involvement in the case um, since um, a meeting between uh, Wilson uh, and the prior attorney, um, Lance. Uh, Hendrick. Well, I'd like to say on the record, and I would like you to put on the record, I believe that Lance is a uh, is a great attorney. I mean, he did a bang up job in Carvel's criminal case, and uh, you know, uh, you know, I can't speak as to why you know he was not interested in pursuing the civil part of it, but um, you know, Vesp has has kind of you know just refused to to um, speak to anybody about the case since that meeting between um, Hendrick. Best and Wilson, um, and so right when I was doing my investigation into Jesus's complaint when I did the story last year, uh, it was alleged by some of the people I was talking to that Mr. Vest was actually getting uh, I hate to say pressure or a heat from members of the police department uh, because of his work on this case. Um, it, it, do you hear anything like that involving that or not? You know, I have heard things like that. Um, you know, I can't confirm it uh, at this time. I mean, um, eventually we hope to get, you know, Mr. Vest on the record and see what he has to say about those things. Right, because he, um, he, at this time, I mean, I, I do I do not know. I don't know if it was pressure. I don't know what, you know, really, um, you know, what it was. Um, so until we have an affirmative, you know, um, knowledge of, of evidence that exists that, that demonstrates that. I mean, I can't say whether that is the case or not. Um, what I can say is that, you know, after that meeting, you know, essentially, Carl, uh, Jesus was given, you know, an ultimatum, either, you know, the, the state was going to um, oppose and, and, and delay the sealing of his record, you know, with this, um, or, you know, if he pursued the 
attorney's fees motion that Lance had filed. And ultimately, because of employment reasons, as I'm sure you can understand, um, you know, having this allegation out there that you're, you know, a rapist right. is going you know, to hinder your ability to get your life back together. And so ultimately, you know, uh, Jesus you know, decided to pull that motion after that meeting with Wilson. Okay, because uh, Gavin's um, Mr. Vest re- investigative report, I thought was uh, outstanding. I mean, he did a hell of a job on that, on the stuff oh, that yeah, he uncovered. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. yeah, it was uh, very detailed, and I put some of that in my first story. Some of that will be on screenshots when I do this podcast on on what we're talking about here today. Let me ask you a question, so uh, the listeners will understand this. Why do you file a lawsuit in federal court? versus uh, district court from the state of Nevada. What is the difference, and, and why do you do that? Well, I mean, number one, the damages are capped in state court. So, um, yeah, that's one thing. Number two, uh, you know, 1983 actions are, uh, are are limited to federal court, and, and they involve, you know, when there is a, you know, constitutional violation that, like, like the one that is, like, what has occurred here, Violations of due process, violations of uh, of right, you know, to be free from unreasonable search and seizure. You know, those things typically go forward in federal court. Okay, so, so, so basically, basically, the lawsuit is a federal civil rights lawsuit because the people alleged in the complaint violated his civil rights by by arresting him uh, when they shouldn't have. In essence, is that exactly. true? And and yeah. Yeah, and the, you know, the violations are, you know, are pretty clear, you know, it, you know, they misrepresented facts to the judge that issued the search warrant to arrest him and search his property. And so, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty unmistakable, you know, misrepresentations that were made. And so, yeah, that's why we felt very comfortable, you know, bringing the case and, uh, and, and making the allegations as they are. Okay. Now in federal court, um, I believe in state court, and I don't know if, if, the, the number is correct. I heard there's a about a two hundred thousand dollar cap on the police department being held responsible in a civil suit, and you're saying that in a federal civil rights suit that there is no cap on that. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, that's yeah because I know a lot of people have been asking me on the emails I got this morning on that. So anything else you guys want to say? Because I'm gonna go ahead and use this in the podcast when I do it tonight or tomorrow on this case. You know, I, I think that's it. I mean, uh, you know, we're, we feel pretty strongly about this because, uh, you know, it, it, this is a case where, you know, essentially the police and the district attorney's office and some, you know, corrupt metro detectives uh, all conspired to not only take away our client's liberty, uh, but then, uh, you know, sweep it under the rug, essentially, when, when you know, Mr. Carvajal attempted to regain his attorney's fees from, you know, this wrongful arrest. So, um, you know, just kind of to add that. And then um, not only was it the, you know, the wrongful arrest, it was just the biggest deal. I know Mike, Mike touched on it, but it was uh, the continued fraudulent actions of, you know, the DA's office that, uh, you know, in concert with the detectives that, that sort of kept him there. And so it wasn't just one thing. It was a continuing action that pattern um, that, that sort of led to this injustice. Okay. Let me ask you one more question before we go. I see in the complaint where you're bringing up um, some of the stuff on Marlon Brown, who was uh, convicted and is in jail now. Um, he was the owner of the Top Notch Unlicensed Club. And you're bringing up some stuff about uh, Judge Tobiason's allegations about her giving information to Metro on uh, illegal vice activities that wasn't followed up. What is a, uh, what is a Marnell if I'm saying it right, what is a Monell suit in reference to that? Is that well, what? Yeah, a Monell liability claim is a, it's, it's a municipal liability claim. So just because the county or city, you know, employs the tort visa doesn't make the county or city liable. Now they, they still defend, you know, the people who are the tort visa. In this case, um, the individual named defendant. Um, but to actually get um, the, you know, to to establish that the county is, is liable as a defendant as well, um, you have to allege that there is a policy and practice within the municipal 
subdivision like the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department or the Clark County DA, and that that policy, practice, or custom is what resulted in the constitutional violations. And so here, I mean, we have seen corrupt police, you know, actions of police and prosecutors um, repeatedly for the past five, you know, six years. Right. And so it just, it, you know, it's at this point, it's not just one isolated incident. This is a, a, a pattern, a custom and practice of, of the county failing to properly train, failing to properly discipline, you know, people within, you know, these, these, uh, you know, county and city agencies. And, you know, they continue to violate people's constitutional rights, continue to engage in this public corruption. They do not get disciplined. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's a custom and practice at this point, instead of result, instead of doing what is necessary to rid, you know, the, these, you know, different departments from, you know, these people engaging in this corruption. Instead, they're just trying to sweep it under the rug. One pretty clear example of that is the fact that Detective Chiraska and Samuel Martinez, the two, that's the attorney, the district attorney who lied to the, to the Justice Court judge, um, as alleged in the complaint, and the cop who lied in the request to get the search warrant, those are the two people that are involved in now the prosecution of um, Tommy Lee Provost, who is the man who was arrested afterwards. Right. Uh, what discipline did these people get for what they have done here? Um, it's not as if, you know, Wilson was not aware. I mean, the motion, you know, to get attorney's fees was filed. And these people are still involved in, you know, a case that is, you know, in, in, in the subsequent case. Right. And it's like you're, you're, you're sac- you know, you're, you're putting at risk the prosecution of this other person whether he may be guilty or not, I mean, there may be other, you know, the continued, you know, mistakes and 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 and, and uh, intentional misrepresentations in the investigation. In that case, we don't know. Um, but you know, why are these people not being disciplined? Why is this, you know, the custom and 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 practice of these two institutions to sweep this stuff under the rug instead of addressing a serious problem within within them? Um, and that's essentially what we are we are alleging here that the county is responsible because the county is not doing what is necessary to prevent this public corruption that has been going on for years now. Okay. Yeah, I just want to kind of add to that too. That's sort of another example of, of of how we feel that they are systematically sort of obstructing and hiding and deflecting these things. Is you know when it, when when you know Metro received a valid court order forcing them or ordering them to turn over records into the alleged. Uh, you know, into, into the uh, FBI, yeah. FBI investigation, not even alleged, it was active FBI investigation, they flat refused, um, you know, just refused to provide those records. And, uh, you know, if there's, if there's not a practice of, of cover-up, why wouldn't they just turn it over? So, you know, we kind of brought that in as well. Right. Let me ask you a question on that. Being that you have this case filed already in federal district court on Mr. Jesus Carvajal, when it gets to discovery, if it goes that far, are you going to be able to um, get documents relating to these other cases to support your case? Is that a possibility? That is that is, that is what we will be seeking. Okay. Correct. Okay. Because um, you know we act. You know. You know. If as long as it's sufficiently pled, we get past the motion to dismiss, and then you know we would get discovery into those issues that are alleged in that. And you know we believe that the evidence of those uh, you know those cases will 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 show um, that this is is occurring and, and that the individuals that are doing this stuff are just not being disciplined. You know, instead the department is coalescing around these you know these bad actors and allowing them to continue to engage in this conduct. And instead of addressing it by either terminating them or disciplining them, they're just allowing them to continue to do this and, and they're hiding it. And, and that's, you know, an issue. I mean, you know, that's a problem. It, it, it damages the entire justice system and the public's faith in the justice system when people in power such as this continue to do this stuff. 
um, and and then try and sweep it under the rug. It's, it, it, it undermines, you know, the entire judicial process and the entire judicial system when they, you know, continually do this thing. Right. I, I looked at the complaint briefly, and I also read in there that you brought up the Ocean Fleming case. And Ocean Fleming, in case people don't know, was um, a, a man, an alleged pimp, who was uh, was arrested and charged with like 17 counts for being a pimp and some other charges. And those cases were all dropped except for one case, which he was let out of jail for um, last year, I believe, on that. Of course. But, but in that case, um, because I see it brought up in this case, the attorneys hired by Sheriff Joe Lombardo, who runs the Las Vegas Metro Police Department, um, when he hired this law firm that represented the department, the, one of the attorneys actually said in court during one of the motions, the proceedings in the Ocean Fleming case, that they did not want this alleged corrupt cop named Christopher Bouthman to testify because they knew, the attorney said this in court, that he would implicate other cops. And um, exactly. and I did a story on that, and a lot, of, not only me as an ex-cop found that um, horrendous, but I got so many emails from people saying, wait a minute. Would the attorney for the police department, who was hired by the sheriff because he runs the police department, Joe Lombardo, he's the head of the LVMPD, hired a, a law firm to prevent the testimony of an alleged corrupt cop because this attorney said in court, and it is in the court record, that they knew that if that cop testified, he would implicate other police officers, in essence, who have not even been brought up in the investigation. And what ended up what happening was, uh, to my knowledge, is Baufman ended up taking the fifth. But that was one of the biggest boatload of emails I got from people said, and I said it too in one of my stories, why would any police chief or sheriff not want to know if there's other corrupt cops on a police department and, and do what they did on this one? And, and again, Steve Wilson, the attorney, the district attorney, went along with this because it was one of his ADAs who was prosecuting the case against Fleming to keep him in jail and stuff. So, yeah. Okay. And so all those other cops that they said that this guy is going to implicate, they're all still working for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police tomorrow. The, the, the attorney, you know, that was involved in that case, Liz Mercer, she is still there. I mean, what, you know, you know, it, it, it is just a, a, a flat out policy of when people within these agencies get caught engaging in serious misconduct, these you know, the leaders of these agencies just try to sweep it under the rug. They try to prevent, you know, the public from discovering, you know, what is going on. And, you know, that is something that needs to get addressed. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, until, you know, there are consequences for doing these kind of things, um, you know, there, there, there will be lawlessness. And, and, and that's essentially what we have here a lawless district attorney's office and a lawless, you know, police department that, you know, when people within their ranks violate the law, they just, you know, instead of addressing the problem, they sweep it under the rug. Right. Um, That's the problem. So so this case, in essence, could have far-reaching implications other than just Jesus' case, Mr. Carvajal's case. Yes. Okay. Yes, it can. And I don't know if you guys are aware, but I've been a year, almost two years now, if not more, um, I've been doing the stories. I don't know if you're familiar with the Land Kaufman 2016 Unsolved Murders. And and one of the big things that came out that I uncovered in that case was a text message that was sent to Connie Land, the mother of Sydney Land, one of the victims in the Unsolved Murders, which will be four years coming up in October, Unsolved. It was a text message that was sent in 2017 by Las Vegas uh, Metro Homicide Detective Mitchell Dorsch, who in essence told her in that text message, and I published that in multiple stories, that the case was basically botched and compromised because he's seen so many things that he's never seen before. So many things happened that him and his partner are left to pick up the pieces, and then he says uh, those instances are well documented or chronicled, if chronicled was the word that he used. And to this day, Metro a numerous media requests I've had for a year and a half on that, to me, is to say, and how was a double homicide investigation compromised when your detective working the case, one of the two detectives, sends a text message to the mother of the dead girl, in essence saying, the case is botched up, but I can't tell you why, 
but so many things happen that I've never seen before, and I have them well chronicled. Now we have to pick up the pieces. So there's a lot of other stuff going on in that case also that I think may overlap with some of the stuff you talk about in this case. Anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah. And, and, and we may, you know, we may seek, you know, information on that as well. I mean, you know, it, there, there are just so many examples now in the past few years that have demonstrated that there are, you know, there is some serious misconduct going on and, and, and there does not appear to be a, a, a real, um, you know, willingness within either, you know, either agency to, to address it. Instead, they want their their policy is to cover it up, and that's you know that's a that's bad for justice in the state of Nevada in general. No, I agree. And now my closing comments: What happened to Jesus Carvajal was a disgrace, the result of a rush to judgment by incompetent police detectives, to say the least. One of those detectives involved in the case was Opal Deeds. Then Vice Detective Opal Deeds was rewarded by Clark County Sheriff Joe Lombardo, who runs the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, by being transferred, believe it or not, to the Homicide Bureau. Nothing new with Sheriff Lombardo on a move like that, if you remember from my previous reporting, that then Vice Detective Justine Gaddis, who outed former Las Vegas Justice Court Judge Melanie Andrus Tobiasen in 2016 as a source of confidential information, Gaddis also was rewarded by Lombardo when he transferred Gaddis to the Homicide Bureau. With detectives like this in the Homicide Bureau, it's no wonder that the 2016 double homicide of Sidney Land and Nehemiah Kaufman is now four and a half years unsolved. And by the way, Homicide Detective Opal Deeds, she was in the news about a week ago when she almost became a homicide victim herself when a murder suspect took a firearm away from her in the interrogation room and threatened to kill her and her partner before other officers subdue the suspect. I have no word as of yet if the federal lawsuit that Jesus Carvajal's attorneys filed against Sheriff Joe Lombardo and Clark County District Attorney Steve Wolfson and others will be amended to the estate of Jesus Carvajal. Then, just maybe, in death, Jesus will get the justice he never got in life. And by the way, Jesus told me in 2019 that he never even received an apology from the police or the district attorney's office. Jesus was never at peace with what happened to him, nor should he have been. Rest in peace, Jesus Carvajal, an innocent man wrongfully arrested and charged by Las Vegas Metro Police.